Hello friends, hi, this is uh, Dr. Shonali Chandra and we are beginning the StupaiMed Insta questions and solutions. All right, so here is the first question. All our causes of ambiguous genitalia in an XY child at birth except. Okay, so you can answer these questions with a simple elimination procedure as well. See, understand that how does ambiguous genitalia occur? In the simplistic of forms, ambiguous genitalia happens in an XX fetus if there is excess of androgens, okay? Or in an XY fetus who is otherwise genetically determined to be a male, but in an XY fetus, if the testes don't produce androgens, or the testes produce androgens and they are not acting. All right, so broadly ambiguous genitalia occurs in those, these two scenarios. Now, 21 alpha hydroxylase deficiency, if you remember, is what happens in congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And in congenital adrenal hyperplasia, if the fetus is female, XX, there is XX androgens from the adrenal glands and that leads to ambiguous genitalia. So don't even need to look at the other three options. Here it is only, it is certain that whenever there is 21 hydroxylase deficiency that results in congenital adrenal hyperplasia, adrenal glands produce more androgens and they can masculinize a female fetus. Whereas if you see in the rest of the options, if there is 5-alpha reductase deficiency, then the testosterone cannot be converted into the more active form that is the dihydrogen testosterone. All right. If the partial androgen insensitivity syndrome is there, then the androgens that are being produced by the te fetal testes, they are not, get, uh, they are, cannot act on the target tissues. If there is 17 hydroxylase deficiency, this is the enzyme that is required in testosterone production in the uh, testes. And then there will be less of uh, masculinization of the male fetus. So in all of these three cases, B, C, D options, the fetus is going to be X, Y, and it will lead to inambiguous genitalia because of the deficiency of action of androgens in that particular male fetus. So the answer for this question is option number A, that is 21 hydroxylase deficiency. Hello friends, I'm Dr. Shanali and here is the explanation for the StupaiMed Insta question and solutions number two. So let us, uh, let us read the question first. An Rh negative gravida 2 para 1 life 1 woman has come for her antenatal checkup at 16 weeks, okay? And she's RH negative. She has had an uneventful vaginal delivery two years ago, and she does not recall receiving antibody injection in her past pregnancy. Her husband blood group is RH positive. She has an ICT titer of 1 is to 32. What is the next step in management? So friends, in this case, the ICT titer has crossed the critical value. What is the critical value for the ICT titer? The critical value is 1 is to 16. So it is more than this critical titer. And once the critical titer is crossed, we start monitoring with MCA PSV top the middle cerebral artery PSV Doppler because we know that whenever there is going to be fetal anemia, okay, what will happen is blood flow to the fetus's brain will increase and that can be picked up by the middle cerebral artery Doppler. This is done to detect fetal anemia, to detect fetal anemia. 
yes in the past i agree that amniotic fluid bilirubin uh, level estimation has also been done to detect fetal anemia but nowadays that is replaced by mca psv doppler so that is your answer of choice here to assess amniotic fluid bilirubin levels we will have to amniocet test and that is an invasive test now we have mca psv doppler that is done on ultrasound so that is non invasive and very good test we should do that instead of the amniocentesis if the titer let's in this question if the titer had been less than 1 is to 16 okay let's say for example in this question they would have said titer is 1 is to 8 1 is to 10 1 is to 12 something that is less than 1 is to 12, uh, 16 then what would have been the management then the management would have been repeat the titer in four weeks then you would have repeated the titer monthly or sometimes even uh, at every 15 days so repeating the titer is an option then the titer is less than 1 is to 16 and whenever the titer crosses 1 is to 16 we again move back to doing mca psv top okay hello friends this is dr shanali back with stupiamed insta question and solutions question number 3 so there is a 25 year old primary gravid woman at 8 months of pregnancy complaints of abdominal pain and slight vaginal bleeding on examination the fundal height is above the expected gestational age so fundal height is more with absent fetal heart sounds the most probable diagnosis is see the most probable diagnosis in this case is going to be concealed hemorrhage see hydroamnios also leads to fundal height which is more than the expected gestational age but hydroamnios by itself will not be associated with pain also vaginal bleeding also and absent fetal heart sounds also right so hydroamnios is therefore ruled out in active labor uh, the woman could be in labor yes with abdominal pain and vaginal bleeding but why should the fundal height be more if everything is normal there is something abnormal right and uh no active labor findings like pv findings are mentioned in this question so active labor is also ruled out in uterine rupture yes there will be abdominal pain yes there will be vaginal bleeding but the fundal height more is not oh, that is going to happen in a uterine rupture right in a uterine rupture the contour of the uterus they would have said the contour of the uterus is distorted because of a projecting or bulging fetal part all right so this is not coinciding with uterine rupture as well but the fact that in 8 months of pregnancy preterm prematurity is one this factor for abduction right so basically conceal hemorrhage when happens you know blood collects behind the uh, placenta okay so that is something which is called as abruption placental abruption right so premature separation of a placenta occurs bleeding happens behind the placenta and it is all collecting behind the placenta that is only a slight vaginal bleeding results but such a huge amount of abruption can cause fetus to die also so therefore absent fetal heart sounds so that is our best choice here the answer is concealed hemorrhage or concealed abruption Hello friends I am Dr Shanali back with Stupiamed Insta question and solutions question number 4 So a pregnant lady with persistent variable decelerations at 6 cm persistent variable decelerations at 6 cm Okay is shifted for cesarean section which of the following is not done in the interim management persistent variable decelerations friends you know results because of cord compression because of cord compression right so they are asking you which of the following you will not do will you shift the position uh, shift the patient to supine position that is something that you will not do because remember if 
I told you that the position should be left lateral position. In the left lateral position, what happens is that there is more blood flow to the placenta and also the possibility of lifting up cord compression. So therefore, you will not shift the patient to supine position. This is something that you will not do. Okay, but you will shift the patient into the left lateral position. All right, in the supine position, there is compression of the inferior vena cava and that results in um, less blood flow to the placenta because of supine hypotension. Oxygen inhalation is done, yes, so that oxygenation of the fetus can be improved. IV fluids are also given, yes, so that, again, that the uh, hypotension in the woman that could be contributing to uh, the fetal heart rate decelerations, that can be corrected, so that is also done. Subcutaneous turbotalin, yes, that will also uh, be done in case that she's getting excessive uterine contractions, in case she is getting excessive uterine contractions because excessive uterine contractions also contribute to fetal heart rate decelerations. So yes, oxygen inhalation, IV fluid, subcutaneous turbotalin, all these things are done while shifting the patient to QOT. But remember, we do not shift the patient to QOT in the supine position. We try to shift her in the left lateral position. Hello friends, I'm Dr. Shonali back with Stupiramid Insta question and solutions question number five, right? So let's talk about that question. Vaginal delivery is not allowed in which situation? Monochorionic monomemiotic twins, mento anterior position, first twin vertex and second twin breach or frank breach. Now, friends, this is a simple question. If you remember straight away, if you remember straight away, vaginal delivery is not allowed in monochorionic, monoamniotic twins. Twins which are sharing a placenta, monochorionic, and twins which are sharing the amniotic cavity as well. There is no intervening separation, no intervening amniotic membrane between the two twins, A and B. So what can happen? Cord entanglement can happen in these twins. In monochorionic monoamniotic twins, cord entanglement can happen. Also, interlocking of fetal parts, interlocking of fetal parts can happen, and that is why vaginal delivery is not allowed in monochorionic monoamniotic twins. Okay, they are delivered by elective cesarean section elective cesarean section between 32 to 34 weeks all right after giving steroid cover vaginal delivery is allowed in mento posterior position a mento anterior position yes it is allowed but vaginal delivery is not allowed in mento posterior position in a persistent mento posterior position Vaginal delivery is not allowed. Okay, when the first twin is vertex and the second twin is breech, yes, vaginal delivery is allowed, right? But when the first twin is anything that is not cephalic, that means non vertex, if the first twin is transverse, if the first twin is breech, then vaginal delivery is not allowed. In frank breech, Yes, in frank breach, vaginal delivery can be allowed. Yes, even in uh, complete breach, that is the flexed breach, both in flexed breach as well as frank breach, both vaginal delivery is allowed. So in what kind of breach vaginal delivery is not allowed? When there is footling breach. In footling breach, the chances of cord prolapse are very high so vaginal delivery is not allowed okay or in a breach with extended head breach with an extended head that is also called as stargazer breach in that 
the ginal DOP is not allowed. So in all of these conditions, what is done? A cesarean section is done. Hello friends, I'm Dr. Shonali. Back with the uh, Stupiramid Insta question and solutions. Question number six. Chances of congenital heart disease in a newborn are increased if the mother suffers from all of the following except. So they are asking you in which of the conditions the fetus is at risk of having a congenital heart disease except which condition does not lead to a congenital heart disease in the fetus. So let's see. What about congenital heart disease? Let's go from D to A. From D to A. So what happens if the mother is herself suffering from a congenital heart disease like a tetralogy of palate which has been corrected or um, a Marfan syndrome or the mother has a disorder like uh, ASD or PSD? Then what happens? The fetus that she's carrying is at risk of a congenital heart disease. So yes, chances of congenital heart disease increases if the mother is also having a congenital heart disease. What about diabetes mellitus? Yes, if the mother is suffering from a type 2 diabetes mellitus or type 1 diabetes mellitus, anything that is pre-existent diabetes, right? That she has had diabetes and then she's got pregnant because of the uh, abnormal uh, sugar values in the periconceptional period. So diabetes mellitus is also a risk factor for congenital heart disease. In fact, uh, congenital heart disease is the most uh, calm heart uh, the Cardiac system is the most common system uh, to result in anomalies in case of a diabetes mellitus. So yes, diabetes mellitus is also a risk factor. Now you have to choose between option A and B, systemic lupus erythematosus and rheumatoid arthritis. Now systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE, if the mother has SLE, there is risk in the fetus of having, the fetus is at risk of having a congenital heart block, a congenital heart block. The antibodies, the antibodies that are present in systemic lupus uh, erythematosus in the mother, they can cross the placenta, reach the fetus, go to the fetal heart and create fibrosis in the fetal heart in the fetal heart so fibrosis in the uh, you know in the bundle of haze and in all the bundles which are transmitting the electrical impulses of the heart in the fetus they can lead to congenital heart block because the antibodies associated with sle can cross the placenta and cause fetus uh, fibrosis in the fetal heart as well in the conducting system of the fetus heart. So rheumatoid arthritis is our answer here. So yes, with SLE, with diabetes, with congenital heart disease, the fetus is at risk of having a congenital heart disease. But with rheumatoid arthritis, no. With rheumatoid arthritis, if the mother suffers uh, from rheumatoid arthritis, there is no risk of congenital heart disease. The newborn. So answer is B. Now this is the first part of the question. A 23-year-old primary gravida at 39 weeks with complaint of uh, leaking of fluid for one day, right? So there is leaking PV. She is 39 weeks. She's primary, fine. She is getting mild pains for the past four hours. She was treated for UTI in the second trimester. Her temperature is 100.7, so she has fever. BP is 120 by 68. That's fine. Pulse is 100 per minute. So she has tachycardia, that's because of the fever, of course. Abdominal examination shows diffuse uterine tenderness. The cervix is 2 cm dilated and pooling of clear fluid in the vagina is seen. So a diagnosis of leaking PV is confirmed. Microscopy of the vaginal fluid shows firming. So any doubt about leaking has been confirmed. So she is, yes, leaking PV. The fetal heart rate is 170 per minute. So there's fetal tachycardia also. She is getting mild contractions. Initial lab tests show HP of 10.2 and a total leukocyte count of 20,000 per mmq. Which, uh, which is the most likely diagnosis? Is it placental abruption? In case of placental abruption, yes, there can be fetal tachycardia also. More likely, there will be fetal distress. Diffuse uterine tenderness is also there in placental abruption. But in this particular case, what has happened? 
there is no complaint of vaginal bleeding there is no relevant clinical history that is signifying that she is having a placental abruption no history of trauma no history of hypertension so placental abruption is not the answer here all right what about pid there is no significant finding of pid also there is no unhealthy vaginal discharge no foul smelling vaginal discharge history or there is no factor which is saying that she could have had a pid early so pid pelvic inflammatory disease is also not the answer what about pyelonephritis could it be pyelonephritis she has a history of uti in the second trimester but she was treated for it right but there are no urinary symptoms that are being mentioned here there is no uh, renal angle tenderness which is being mentioned here right and why would there be diffuse uterine tenderness in the pyelonephritis case so pyelonephritis is also not the answer here. but the clinical picture is classically fitting what intra amniotic infection yes it is fitting porio amnionitis the fact that she has had leaking for one day so 24 hours have gone by prolonged leaking right now she has started pains in the past four hours fine but prolonged leaking is there fever is there diffuse uterine tenderness is there fetal tachycardia is there right raised uh, leukocyte count is there so all is uh, the clinical setting is signifying that there is intra amniotic infection or porio amniotis so answer is option number b now look at the second part of the question in addition to broad spectrum antibiotics obviously there is ut intra uterine infection so you will start broad spectrum antibiotics which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management of this patient should you administer corticosteroids why that it is not preterm right so woman is 39 weeks so corticosteroids are not given and moreover corticosteroids in the presence of frank chorionitis can flare up the infection right so administering corticosteroids is not to be done will you go for expectant management what do you think should we just wait and watch no baba she is having fever fetal tachycardia and prolonged leaking no role of expectant management at all so we know that yes we need to deliver the woman okay we need to deliver the woman that is for certain but the question arises should we do oxytocin augmentation of labor because as per the question she is already in labor right isn't it she is already 2 cm dilated she is getting uterine contractions all right so she is already in labor so should we augment the with oxytocin or should we go for a direct cesarean section there is no need there is no indication of going for a direct cesarean delivery you start antibiotics you give her iv fluids you give her antipyretics and fever control and we augment okay so we administer oxytocin there is no indication of doing a direct cesarean delivery as of now so administering oxytocin to augment the labor that is what the answer is going to be hello friends i'm dr shonali back with uh, stupiamed insta question and solutions question number 8 so let us read this question now a 37 year old fifth uh, gravida 2 para 1 life 1 comes for anc checkup at 16 weeks she has a healthy 5 year old son the woman is herself also healthy and has no family history of genetic disorders or intellectual disability so nothing wrong in her family history nothing wrong in her past history everything is fine so far she has not taken periconceptional folic acid uh, her serum markers are as follows so at 16 weeks she is in the second trimester so we are talking about the second trimester markers which are a part of the quadruple test okay so let's see what those markers tells us they tell us that the serum alpha fetoprotein is decreased beta hcg is increased unconjugated yeast trial is decreased and inhibin a is increased which of the following fetal conditions is most likely failure of closure of neural tube failure of closure of neural tube leads to neural tube defects agreed but neural tube defects are uh, identified by ultrasound and in neural tube defects the maternal serum alpha protein is going to be 
raised, not increase, not decrease. It is increased. All right. I agree that she is not taken very conception of folic acid, but that does not point that she will have a neural tube defects. All right. So failure of neural tube defects is not the answer here. Para umbilical bowel evisceration. What is this para umbilical bowel evisceration? They are talking about gastroschisis. When the bowel loops come out of the anterior abdominal wall, uh, you know, on the side of the umbilicus, right? So that is called a gastroschisis. Even in gastroschisis, what will happen? The maternal serum alpha ketoprotein is raised. So that is also not our answer here. So it is something. It is either option B or option C. So, meiotic non disjunction of chromosome 18. What does that mean? That means trisomy 18. And this second of the option C means trisomy 21. So, please, friends, you have to remember what happens to the serum markers in trisomy 21, that is Down syndrome. So, I have told you that remember this word I. So, the HCG, H for HCG and I for inhibin. Both of these values are increased in Down syndrome. So that is what? Beta HCG increased. Inhibin A increased. And the rest are decreased in what? Down syndrome. So remember in Down syndrome, high. HCG is high. Inhibin is High. So the answer is meiotic non disjunction of chromosome 21. A young 25 year old female came to the gynae OPD with absence of menses for the past three months. So she has amenorrhea for three months. All right. She tells us that three months ago she had undergone a DNC for missed abortion. The pregnancy test is negative. Of course, the first thing that you do when a woman has secondary amenorrhea, you rule out pregnancy, so there is no pregnancy. And you give her a progesterone withdrawal and she has failed to bleed. Her serum estradiol and FSH levels are normal. What is the most likely diagnosis? So you have a clinical history also and lab results are also given to you. You agree that the clinical history points towards uterine synechia, all right? The, uh, the fact that she has had a DNC and that could have led to uterine synechia, that is fibrosis in the uterine endometrium, endometrial fibrosis and everything. And that is called as uterine synechia or Asherman syndrome. So yes, history points towards Asherman syndrome only. But let us see the other options as well. Could it be PCOS? Could it be PCOS? If it should have, if she would have had PCOS, giving progesterone would have led to withdrawal bleeding. In PCOS, there would have been withdrawal bleeding. Withdrawal bleeding would have been present with the progesterone challenge test. So PCOS is not the answer. What about pituitary tumor? If there would have been a pituitary tumor, the FSH levels and the estradiol levels should have been low. The FSH level should have been low, estradiol level should have been low. In premature menopause, the estradiol levels would have been low and the FSH levels would have been high. So premature menopause is also not the answer. Pituitary tumor is also not the answer. So the clinical picture and the fact that even with the normal serum estradiol level, she is unable to bleed by giving progesterone withdrawal, the answer is uterine synechia or Asherman syndrome. All right.